the loudness war. We all endured it, some of us fought in it, and most of us survived to tell the tale. While I feel that we've come back around as an industry to a somewhat reasonable compromise since the worst days of it, uh, it certainly left an indelible mark on the music of the era. Most people associate the loudness wars with the 2000s, and while that certainly was the most egregious period, the idea that louder is better actually started way back in the 1950s. Now, please bear with me, as there were a lot of factors happening around the same times, from industry demands to technical achievements, and a lot of necessary history that can be tough to cover in a linear way. First, we need a little overview of mastering history. Before Ampex invented tape recording in 1948, you were limited to a live performance cut directly to either wire or lacquer disc, then pressed to vinyl. No overdubs, no remixing, just one skilled operator and maybe an assistant handling the capture and execution of this process. When the transition to tape recording became widespread in the early 50s, a new position was needed, the transfer engineer, to ensure that tape recordings were transferred to the cutting lathe properly and a master disc was created without error. As most recording engineers at the time came up in the live to lacquer format, the early years of tape transfer were just a matter of getting a decent level to disc without going too hard. The Recording Industry Association of America, or RIAA, established a standard spec EQ curve for the recording and playback of vinyl records to ensure compatibility across all record label releases and brands of playback turntables, as too much bass could cause a stylus cartridge to jump and skip, resulting in the return of the purchase. A transfer engineer might engage some corrective EQ to adhere to this standard, but the idea of manipulating the tape recording beyond that in a creative manner didn't exist just yet. Eventually, the new possibilities of multi-track tape recording combined with the birth of rock and roll and the invention of electric bass led to some new issues that needed tending. Record labels and artists wanted their latest 45 RPM singles to be the loudest in the jukebox, as something slightly louder will always grab the listener's attention, at least initially. Uh, as told by mastering legend Bob Ludwig, it was common for a label to commission three or four transfers or masters of a single and approve only the loudest one for pressing. Transfer engineers were now being asked to deliver a hot master with no playback issues. Their job had now evolved. Enter compression. Tube limiters have been used for decades in broadcast and PA applications, uh, as well as preventing any strident peaks from ruining a good lacquer cutting. But the idea of using one to manipulate the dynamic range of a recording in a creative way, thereby raising the average level, was new. Uh, additionally, transfer engineers found that boosting the high end slightly, or 3 kilohertz specifically, enhanced the perceived loudness of a master. Uh, in 1959, the Fairchild 660 mono and 670 stereo compressor limiters were released, initially as vital mastering tools, before being found desirable for many other tasks in the recording studio and reaching their own legendary status. Uh, studios often built their own equipment back then as well, so in addition to names like Poltec, Altec, Langevin, Lang, and RCA, you had EMI engineers building their own compressors, Bill Putnam at Universal coming up with all sorts of tech innovations, and Motown building a custom EQ transfer console specifically for their vinyl cutting room. Speaking of Motown, they quickly became known for some of the hottest masters around in the early 60s, and some of the most prominent bass, thanks to half-speed disc cutting techniques and James Jamerson playing that bass, of course. Paul McCartney was a huge fan of Jamerson and Motown, and pushed the Abbey Road engineers for a similar sound, uh, eventually experimenting with Jeff Emmerich on Revolver for some game-changing results. Along with the many technical advancements happening at studios like Abbey Road and Olympic in London, United and Gold Star in Los Angeles, and Atlantic in New York City, amongst others, multi-track tape recording and mixing was being pushed to new limits, and the process of transferring this to vinyl became even more crucial and creative. Also, as the role of music mixing was becoming more defined, an LP album might contain mixes from several different producers, engineers, and studios. Uh, it fell upon the mastering engineer to ensure a balanced, cohesive album assembly from start to finish, and the profession had been yet further defined. At this point, we need to talk about the godfather of modern mastering. Bob Ludwig began his career as a transfer engineer in the late 60s, quickly establishing himself as one of the best in the business at delivering a competitively hot, well-crafted master. Although responsible for an early too-hot cut of Led Zeppelin II, which caused needles to skip and was recalled, and of course is now a collector's item, his track record is nearly unblemished. With 13 Grammys and over 3,000 credits, he helped pioneer the role of the mastering engineer in modern vinyl and CD mastering. First at A&R Studios, then Masterdisc, then Sterling Sound, 
and ultimately his own gateway mastering before retiring in 2023 at the age of 78. As his name is synonymous with mastering for many, uh, his influence on the craft is immeasurable, and he's often referred to as the mastering master. Before we go any further, uh, time for a few technical terms regarding level, loudness, and dynamics that will be important to understand as we get talking about digital and CD mastering. Uh, I'll try to keep them as simple as possible and apologize to any experts who might be listening for dumbing them down a bit for the layman. 0 dB FS, or full scale. This term represents the upper limit of an audio signal in the digital realm uh, used to measure peak transients. Uh, anything peaking above zero is called an over and may cause audible clipping and distortion on a final master. Uh, it can even sound like something is wrong with your stereo. Normalization is the process of raising the highest peaks of an audio program to at or just below zero dB full scale. RMS, or root mean square, the average level of an audio signal's loudness as derived over a period of time. This was the accepted standard of measure for perceived loudness until recently, usually shown in dB full scale for a digital recording. Crest factor. That's the difference in dB between the highest peak level and the RMS average levels and a good indicator of the overall dynamic range of an audio program. Raising RMS levels closer to 0 dB full scale minimizes dynamic range. 0 dB VU. Used to measure the level of audio signal relative to analog voltage and allowing for headroom above zero, usually referenced from negative 14 to negative 20 dB full scale or thereabouts. There's a great article from a 2011 issue of the UK's Sound on Sound magazine that I'll link below, which shows some interesting historical data based on 4,500 singles released from 1969 through 2010. Without quoting the entire article, there was a noticeable increase in crest factor or dynamic range from 1969 through 1980, likely based on the many advances in analog recording and mastering during that time, including enhanced signal-to-noise ratios in recording consoles, outboard equipment, tape machines, and early digital master transfers. RMS remained consistent during this time, and the improved dynamic range and overall high quality remained consistent throughout the 1980s, with vinyl still the most popular format early in the decade. Beginning in 1982, the earliest CDs were mastered to 0 dB VU, based on RMS levels calibrated to zero on the meters of the industry standard Sony PCM1610 digital mastering processor, allowing for 20 dB of headroom above zero and a much lower overall level compared to later peak normalized masters. Essentially, the first CDs were mastered the same as the vinyl of the era, without many additional considerations for the new format. By 1985, with the updated Sony PCM1630 mastering processor, its improved dB full-scale metering and the industry-wide shift towards peak normalization for CD masters, taking advantage of full 16-bit depth, the capabilities of the CD format and its nearly 100 dB dynamic range was reached, preserving those enhanced dynamics in perpetuity and pushing the format to overtake vinyl sales by 1988. Uh, I would consider 1985 through the early 90s to be the peak period of dynamic range and mastering for the CD format, with crest factors of about 15 dB on average throughout popular music. Along with advancements in CD mastering technology came the process of remastering some of the earliest CDs for re-release, as well as more first-time CD releases and the new popularity of greatest hits CD compilations, now at hotter levels than the vinyl format allowed on the original masters. Uh, this period was seen as an opportunity by record companies to resell the same music all over again, with mastering being the easiest place to implement a change that the general public might see as an improvement and worth the repurchase. Of course, this trend continues through this day. The louder is better mantra was fully revived from the 50s, and mastering engineers began experimenting with techniques like light tape compression, high frequency EQ boosting, and soft clip peak limiting to raise RMS levels and perceived loudness compared to the original vinyl or early CD releases. Uh, we see this increase beginning in the late 80s and early 90s, but nothing like we would experience over the next decade. While the golden years of CD mastering may have been in full swing, the dynamic range of the format faced its first real obstacle soon, according to mastering great Bob Katz. The introduction and widespread adoption of the car CD player and portable Discman. While first available in the late 80s as a luxury upgrade, car CD players didn't really become prominent until the mid-90s, and suddenly that wide dynamic range of CD made some music hard to hear over a background of engine noise, air conditioning, and overall traffic sound pollution. Uh, this was especially noticeable when compared to FM radio, 
with its extreme broadcast compression and a dynamic range about half that of CD, less than even cassette tape. Uh, same for using a portable disc man with headphones in an urban environment or loud workplace. Uh, the quality and convenience was not always appreciated due to those same extraneous factors. FM broadcast compression doesn't get nearly enough credit or blame in the influence of general music loudness, especially after the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and rapid monopolization of stations. Way back before this, every station applied its own recipe of broadcast compression, limiting, and maximizing to adhere to FCC standards and a limited dynamic range of operation. Uh, this was done using massive tube units decades ago and the Orbin Optimod and other similar processors in more recent times. And just like other media formats, this turned into a competition between stations to grab the attention of the dial-turning listener with loud and aggressive programming. Throughout the 80s, when FM radio was truly king, mix engineers would use doses of heavy compression to approximate what those broadcast results may end up like for test reference cassettes, taking it for a listen in the car on the drive home and tweaking the mix as needed the next day, but ultimately removing the extreme compression for the final mix and sticking with more modest and subtle stereo bus compression. Since radio stations were still operated independently and the results unpredictable, this type of extreme compression rarely made it onto a master before the mid-90s, but it was the beginning of producers and artists getting accustomed to hearing it. When the monopolization of FM radio by Clear Channel, now iHeartMedia, began post-1996, however, the dynamic processing applied to playback started to become more standardized across stations. While individual broadcast compression on FM transmitters still remained, corporate policies on maximizing, normalizing, and gain reduction programming were issued to all owned and operated stations, ensuring their limited rotation would sound similar from New York to LA and all points in between. Eventually, when radio programming shifted from CD to WAV files, the same pre-processed tracks were sent to all stations under the corporate umbrella. Uh, this is evident in internet streams of radio stations, resulting in the same ultra-compressed result even when bandwidth allows for better. Around that same time, originally released in 1994, a software product by a new company called Waves Audio became prevalent as one of the first processing plugins for computer-based digital audio workstations. Uh, the Waves L1, a brick wall limiter with a new look-ahead feature that allowed it to act quicker on peak transients than analog gear ever could, and thereby raising the average RMS levels higher than ever before on masters and minimizing dynamic range in the process. While recording and mixing in DAWs was still a few years away in the studio world, Mastering engineers were already using two-channel DAWs like Sonic Solutions and Sound Designer 2 for final assembly, PQ coding, and now thanks to Waves, brick wall limiting is a final step. Uh, the idea of presenting a master to a record label or clear channel programmer with the same sort of overhyped, excited FM radio vibe started to take form. One of the first albums often mentioned as the beginning of the modern CD loudness wars was Oasis' What's the Story Morning Glory, released in 1995 with a crest factor or dynamic range of about half the previous average. What's interesting about this is it's only slightly hotter overall than the band's previous album, Definitely Maybe, and was originally mixed and mastered by the same person, producer Owen Morris. Uh, Morris has detailed mastering each album with a similar process, using a TC Electronics EQ and the soft limit clipping feature of an Apogee A to D converter to push his Definitely Maybe mixes as hot as possible then doing the same for Morning Glory with Neve 1081 EQs on the brink of distortion before the Apogee clipping. Morris claims that no other master was delivered to the record company for either album, although there are additional credits for the Morning Glory UK CD release, Barry Grint of Abbey Road Studios, and Vlad O'Meller of Sony Studios in the US. It's possible they both worked off of Morris's original masters for the various releases, uh, but there doesn't seem to be any concise info on that, with Morris even claiming others have tried to take credit for his work. Uh, the original U.S. release is actually a touch lower in level than the U.K., but the massive popularity of the album worldwide brought a new loudness to the forefront of the industry. There are a lot of assumptions that the Waves L1 was responsible for the extreme for its time Oasis mastering, uh, but Owen Morris never mentions it specifically, only that he used the sound designer DAW for final assembly in Morning Glory. Uh, could just be a coincidence of timing, or possibly utilized by those other credited mastering engineers after the fact. Either way, the modern loudness war had officially begun, and RMS levels would continue to increase while dynamic range decreased into the next decade, evidenced by that great Sound on Sound article. Naturally, the widespread popularity of the L1 in mastering studios led to a new hardware processor aimed at the recording studio, 
the TC Electronics Finalizer, released in 1996. While subtle mixed bus compression was a standard process since the 80s, using the finalizer to approximate L1-type mastering levels and radio compression on a final mix started to become a trend. And while it could offer a decent compromise for a project that didn't have the budget for true mastering, the prevalence of the finalizer on mixes still bound for mastering was an unfortunate trend circa 2000 and still a harbinger of worse to come. The more affordable Finalizer Express made its way into many home and project studios around this time. Uh, and as DAW mixing increased, the New Wave's L2 Ultra Maximizer plugin found its way onto master faders, becoming even more prevalent than the Finalizer ever was. If you were playing the music industry game like I detailed in my spec deal video around this time, the importance of presenting a master level product to a shop attorney or A&R rep was crucial, and not every spec deal producer could afford mastering sessions with a George Marino or Ted Jensen. Uh, ditto that for presentations radio programmers. What the L1 did for masters in the late 90s was now happening to final mixes, and dynamics never stood a chance. As this was an industry-wide trend, uh, we couldn't possibly talk about all of the bastardized releases of the era, uh, but there are a few infamous examples we must mention. 1999's Californication by the Red Hot Chili Peppers was one of the first widely popular examples of audible clipping and digital distortion on a CD release, uh, something usually prevented in the past but now seemingly aimed for. Produced by Rick Rubin and mastered by Vlado Meller, who would earn the nickname Vlad the Impaler during this period, these two names are common in discussions of the loudness war, both in tandem and separately. Uh, I remember Metallica bragging on their website blog that 2003's St. Anger would be the loudest CD ever while attending their mastering sessions with Meller. Uh, little did anyone know they'd earn that title in earnest a few years later. Sometimes it can be difficult to pinpoint exactly where the audible clipping is occurring, as extreme abuse in a mixing stage was also becoming commonplace, as we mentioned. But peaks above 0 dB full scale on a final mix can be minimized in mastering and prevented from reaching the final master in pressing. Uh, according to the Dynamic Range Database, linked below, the U.S. CD release of Californication exceeds 0 dB FS, point of digital clipping, on several tracks. Uh, that tells me it was likely a mastering choice, uh, especially since certain vital releases of the album don't have audible distortion apparent on engineer Jim Scott's mix or on the vinyl mastering. Hard clipping has been used on more aggressive hip-hop, industrial, and extreme metal recordings in the past, uh, but that was always more of a creative choice in the tracking or mixing stage, and not a glaring blight on a relatively softer rock song like Scar Tissue. Speaking of Rick Rubin, uh, he developed a workflow on his production similar to the multiple vinyl transfers of the 50s and 60s, uh, but with mixing as well as mastering involved. Not sure when it began, but in the early 2000s, uh, it was common for Rick to have several mix engineers have a go at a particular project, then after choosing his favorite mixer, would do the same with mastering. As Rick was producing some of the biggest modern rock albums of the era, this became a bit of a competition, and some mixers started getting wins by pushing their mixes into the kind of compression and clipping territory that they knew Rick favored from his mastering tastes. I give Rick credit that he's always insisted he doesn't care how something is done, just whether the result moves him emotionally or not, and based on his decades of success, it's tough to dispute that. Uh, I do know of at least one mixer, Rich Costi, who has admitted he grew tired of this constant competition and pulled himself out of the pool after dissatisfaction with how one of his album mixes was handled. Uh, not positive which album this was, but have a good guess based on the era and personnel. Two other infamous Rubin productions deserve mention. The first, 2005's Volume 3, The Subliminal Verses by Slipknot, mixed by Greg Fiddleman and mastered by Ted Jensen, has audible distortion from clipping and greatly reduced dynamic range from compression and brickwalling. Uh, only about a 3 dB dynamic range total. Even when compared to their other loud, aggressive releases, this is extreme, uh, but the CD does not have any peaks over 0 dB FS, thankfully. The next example could be its own discussion entirely, and that's 2008's Death Magnetic by Metallica. With a dynamic range of only 2 to 3 dB, and every song peaking over 0 dB full scale on the original CD release, audible distortion throughout, and the greatest case of ear fatigue that I've ever experienced, Death Magnetic won the loudness war, as mixer Andrew Sheps has proudly stated. In fairness, Greg Fiddleman mixed some of it too. Mastering engineer Ted Jensen even responded to fan criticism via email, stating that the mixes were brickwalled when he received them, and he was not proud to be associated with the project, clearly not as proud as Sheps was. What made this release so infamous was that, coinciding with the album release, the tracks became available for the popular video game Guitar Hero, via stem submixes submitted to the gaming company before the aforementioned brick walling and clipping, 
giving fans a clear cut before and after comparison with many preferring the sound of the video game tracks. Uh, something like 20,000 fans signed an online petition to have the album remixed and remastered, but to no avail, as the band denied there was anything technically wrong with the release at the time. It's also worthy to note that the same year as Death Magnetic, Guns N' Roses released the long-awaited Chinese Democracy and went in the opposite direction for an incredibly dynamic master by the great Bob Ludwig. Bob presented Axl Rose and producer Karim Costanzo with three versions of his master, loud, moderate, and dynamic, and to his surprise and delight, they chose the most dynamic option. For all the criticism of Axl and the nearly 10 years of work that went into that album, he deserves a lot of credit for this choice. Thankfully, not everyone in the industry had lost their minds. While Death Magnetic and Guitar Hero may have made the extremes obvious to many casual listeners, didn't stop the perpetuation of it. Ruben struck again with Black Sabbath's 13 in 2013, mixed again by Andrew Sheps, but mastered by Stephen Markison. Every track peaks over 0 dBFS, and the clipping distortion is obvious, but at least the overall dynamic range is a more modest 5 to 6 dB compared to Death Magnetic's 2 to 3. I'm certainly not trying to criticize any mixing or mastering engineers who were just trying to make a living during this time period, doing what the industry had deemed necessary and began creeping towards inch by inch or dB by dB since the 1950s. Not everyone has the ability or clout to challenge direction from a producer, artist, or label in such a competitive field without the risk of losing work. And this wasn't just happening with heavy rock and metal music either. Hip-hop, contemporary rock, R&B, pop, country, and all sorts of other artists and genres were guilty, as well as multitudes of remastered legacy albums. Ricky Martin's 1999 hit single Live in La Vida Loca was one well-known example, uh, as well as the Black Eyed Peas' Ella Funk, featuring the big hit Let's Get It Started in 2004. And in terms of dynamics, the 1997 CD reissue of Iggy and the Stooges' Raw Power infamously features a 1 dB dynamic range, with the closest RMS levels to 0 dB full scale without overs that I could find for an artist of that level. It should be a cautionary example of brick wall limiter abuse. Some consider this the loudest CD ever mastered, but I find Death Magnetic physically hurts a bit more. What did help eventually was the growing popularity of iTunes, Apple Music, and music streaming in general. With iTunes single sales peaking and surpassing CDs by 2012, a listener shuffling through their Metallica collection on their iPod or phone would be blasted directly in the earbuds by a Death Magnetic tune coming on after the original master of, say, Master Puppets or Ride the Lighting. Even with Apple Soundcheck enabled, which normalized to an RMS standard until recently, the jump in volume was obvious and startling to many. And when compared to the more recently remastered versions of their back catalog, closer in level to the newer releases, the audible clipping and distortion of Death Magnetic was even more apparent at equal volume. Finally, after years of denying there was anything wrong with the initial release, the band finally issued a remastered for iTunes version of Death Magnetic in 2015, devoid of clipping and extraneous distortion, much more pleasing to the ear. I've heard more than one fan state the album went from a least favorite to a top three after that remaster, and I felt this capitulation by one of the biggest bands in the world was a great sign for the industry as a whole. Although we're still louder and less dynamic than the golden age of CD mastering, it's an acceptable compromise from the worst of it for many of us. Now, most media streaming services are normalizing playback to integrated LUFS, or loudness units full scale, a measurement more in line with how the human ear perceives loudness, with an emphasis on the frequency spectrum instead of just overall RMS average. For example, a bass-heavy song may lead to a high RMS level, but the perceived loudness may be lower compared to a track with the 3 to 4 kilohertz upper mid-range area emphasized, and any odd harmonic distortion generated from hard clipping appearing in that upper mid-range treble area as well. This is the range that causes ear fatigue. It's not perfect, but it's getting closer, and with the most popular streaming providers like Spotify and Apple Music playing back at or near the same perceived loudness levels, there's no longer any real incentive for mastering or mixing engineers to push their work to these extreme limits anymore. Personally, I've been using Tidal Hi-Fi for music streaming over the last few years and have none of the level jumping complaints that were an issue uh, in years past on iTunes and other services. Just as many forms of traditional sound engineering have been devalued in the modern industry, mastering might be the most heavily affected with adaptive plugins and AI algorithms available now for a fraction of what a quality mastering session would cost and still a bit of a negative connotation lingering over the profession from the loudness war hangover. Uh, it's really too bad because with so much home recording and mixing happening in less than ideal environments, quality mastering really should be more important than ever. The one aspect of mastering that I valued the most as a mixer 
was the additional perspective of an experienced set of ears in an ideal acoustically treated environment, certainly more ideal than my home studio. Uh, it wasn't just about the compression or EQ, but the feedback I got that helped me make my next mix even better. Uh, when I was at my busiest, I worked with Brad Blackwood of Euphonic Masters as much as possible. Uh, our first project together was actually when he was still at Arden Studios in Memphis. It became invaluable to get his perspective and hear the results of my mixes after sending them to him. Brad never defaulted to louder is better mode like so many others, and I appreciated that tremendously. There were a few times when a client insisted on going with someone else for a louder master, as this was the mid-2000s and loud was in, but I always did my best to try and convince them otherwise, uh, even demonstrating how a crushed master can result in ear fatigue at louder listening levels. Like all battles, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but Brad's work speaks for itself over the past 20 plus years. So to summarize all of this, the louder is better mantra is as old as recorded music, from jukeboxes to radio stations to CD remasters. But when combined with new technology, it pushed things beyond reasonable limits and led to a gradual game of one-up and shit that lasted until the public at large decided it had enough. Uh, it's always too bad when the worst offenders create an awareness of something that could have been prevented in the first place, but in the end, I suppose that's just human nature. If you have any personal experience with album mastering or just as a casual listener, uh, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. Uh, I'll be back soon with a three-part series on the evolution of modern production techniques and uh, how we got here as an industry.